Dad, um, I want to welcome Senator Janet Rice, uh, who we all know is a great supporter of Tibet. And uh, this is Senator Rice's last week in, in Parliament. And uh, next week, sorry, we've got one more week. Wonderful. So please give a warm welcome to Senator Janet Rice. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for being here. Thank you for speaking up for human rights of the Tibetan people and for human rights of people around the world. I want to acknowledge that we are here in Ngunnawal and Gambri country, stolen Aboriginal land. This land is, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And I really want to pay my respects to all First Nations elders, past and present, and to any First Nations peoples from Australia who will be here with us today. Of course, I know just looking at the crowd around us and so many people, so many Tibetans here, that there are so many of you of the First Nations peoples of Tibet who are here with us today, who need to have your rights upheld, that your land is your land, it is Tibetan land. I, today, speaking out about human rights in Tibet, it's something we, we, it can feel so despairing. You now I woke up this morning and just listened to the news and the state of the world at the moment where we've got you know, the, the new laws in Hong Kong and the sort of the crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong. We've got the Chinese foreign minister here today and we know that, look, our government, I, I hope that Foreign Minister Penny Wong has raised human rights, has raised Tibet with him but it will be sort of saying, oh, you have to, you know, be concerned about what's going on in Tibet and he will nod his head and that's it and they then move on to something else. And we know that, you know, it was good to see the Australian government in our response to the Chinese Universal Review of Human Rights to raise Tibet. But we need to be doing a lot more because human rights matter for everyone, no matter where you are around the world. Whether you are fighting for the human rights of the Ukrainians who are being invaded by Russia, whether you are fighting for the human rights of the Palestinians who are being invaded by Israel, whether you are fighting for the human rights of the West Papuans who have under occupation by the Indonesians, for the rights of Kashmiris who are under occupation by India, and for the rights of Tibetans who are under occupation by the government of China. And just because this occupation happened, happened decades ago, we cannot afford to just say, oh, well, that was in the past and that's how it is now. It is something that we have to keep active on, keep fighting on, and particularly given that the Chinese repression of the Tibetan people is ongoing and accelerating. The awful news coming out of Tibet of children you know, as young as four and five and six being taken from their parents and being brought up in Chinese-run boarding schools where they are removed from their culture, they are removed from their language, they are removed from their family and their lands. And to hear the heartbreaking stories of when they return to Tibet, not being able to speak the same language as their parents and grandparents. It is heartbreaking. It is cultural genocide. It really is. And you then hear of, of Tibetan people being forced, of, um, Tibetan nomads being forced off their land and being taken away as a forced labour in, in Chinese, um, Chinese factories and people being removed from their homelands. This is not okay. As, and that the issue of the Uyghurs, as has just been, just been raised, we have the issue of the of the Uyghurs, where the same practices are happening, fighting the people being oppressed, being persecuted, because and the only reason is because they're speaking up for their rights and they're speaking up for their identity of Uyghurs, of Tibetan people, of being a Hong Kongers and being a, a democratic people, let alone the people who are fighting for democracy within China, who we know are jailed and that they too are tortured and that they too are executed for fighting for their rights. Australia's relationship with China is incredibly important. We can have a healthy relationship with China, but it has to put human rights at the centre of it. And when we find out and when we hear about and when we know about what's going on, then we've got to speak up. And the very fundamental, the first absolute minimal thing that the Australian government should be fighting for and basically telling China we cannot have a usual 
relationship with you unless this happens is to allow international human rights observers into China, into Tibet, into the Uyghur territories, into East Turkestan, so that we can actually have some visibility as to what's going on. Because we know from what is smuggled out, we know from the news that, that what is going on is unacceptable. What is going on is cultural genocide. So we as Australians have a responsibility. We need to speak up for human rights and we need to speak out against human rights abuses wherever they occur in the world. So I thank you all for being here today and for speaking up and standing up and speaking out for the people of Tibet and for the other people who are being persecuted around the world. And I want to let you know that all of our Greens, my Greens Party colleagues stand with you. And I am leaving the Senate in a month's time, but all of the remaining Greens people who are here are, have your back and they are going to be supporting you. So I personally will also be continuing to speak up and to be working for freedom and justice for Tibetan people. And I will continue to do that because it matters. But if, if people are being attacked around the world, it matters to all of us. None of us are free unless all of us are free. So thank you for your efforts and we will continue the struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Your years and years of support are something that has powered us and given us energy and you've supported us non-stop and uh, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts and uh, we really look forward to seeing um, you continue to engage with us and whatever you do next and best wishes. Um, we have to, as Indigenous peoples ourselves, acknowledge wherever we are in Australia that we are on the lands of the Aboriginal people, that sovereignty was never ceded that the Aboriginal people's fight is fundamentally and intrinsically connected and tied to ours. As, um, as the Senator mentioned, like not just the Uyghurs, but the Tibetans as well, our children are being stolen. And let's just be clear, where did the Chinese government learn these ideas? They learned them from the atrocities that were committed here in Australia and in Canada. So I want to just um, now invite um, uh, our good friend, Senator Lydia Thorpe, to say a few words. Um, Senator Lydia Thorpe is the first Aboriginal woman in, uh, elected to the uh, uh, Australian Senate on behalf of Victoria and is uh, a great activist and a leader in her community. So please welcome Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, genocide is something that this colony knows very, very well. Yes. Genocide in this country against my people has been happening for almost 250 years. Yes. We understand your pain, we understand your struggle, and we know what it's like to be oppressed in our own country, just like you are in your country. We know that they take your children away, we know that they put them in private boarding schools so that they could be assimilated and lose their language, their connection, and their families, and their identity. That is exactly what happens here. And we will continue to fight for you and for everybody else who's con who continues to be oppressed. And uh, the effects of genocide is real and it's our babies, it's our women, and our men that are continually persecuted. What is happening here today where we have our foreign minister facilitating a conversation with a so-called leader who allows genocide in your country is shameful. Shame. 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 And the reason why the foreign minister in this country allows and facilitates these conversations with, with leaders who allow genocide in their own country is because that minister is also complicit in the genocide of our people. 23,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children have been stolen from their families in 2024. Shame. 2024, today. So we will always stand in solidarity with you as first peoples of this country who will continue to resist just as you are. My heart, my love, my strength goes to every protester, every resistance fighter of your people. And we will stand with you. You are welcome in this country 
and we will fight with you against the genocide in your country and here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. What a powerful message, and that gives us lots of inspiration and energy for the rest of the day. I'd like to now invite Senator Steele, John, uh, on behalf of the Greens, uh, spokesperson for the Greens on uh, foreign policy, and uh, a great friend of ours. So please welcome Senator Steele, John. Thank you so much. And I want to begin uh, by acknowledging that we are gathered together on First Nations land on unceded Nunawal and Nambari country. Uh, pay respect to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty over this land was and has never been ceded. I am very conscious that I speak today as a member of the Australian Parliament. I am proudly a member of the Australian Greens who have a 30 year history of championing democracy and human rights in Australia and around the world but nevertheless I am an Australian MP and to be an Australian MP means to be a member of an institution which has historically worked uh, to further and to deepen the violence, the exploitation, the extraction and the erasure of First Nations peoples here in Australia. This building behind me is built. This political body exists upon land stolen from First Nations people. And the government existent within it is a government which consistently violates human rights, consistently fails to apply humanitarian law, consistently and accord in accordance uh, with international law and a government which has consistently failed to engage and to call out human rights abuses. And so when a foreign minister of China or any other nation comes to Australia, uh, it would be right for that representative to call out Australia on our human rights abuses and failure to uphold international law. And so too, an Australian government and an Australian foreign minister truly connected to the people, truly uh, supportive of democracy and human rights across the world must clearly and assertively speak up for human rights just as we should invite that criticism of ourselves. And what is so disappointing, what is so quite frankly outrageous is that in the building behind me today, the Australian government is failing to take the opportunity to clearly speak up for human rights in Tibet, to clearly speak up and to call out the human rights abuses perpetrated against the Uyghur peoples, to clearly uh, speak up and to condemn the treatment of those who may practice different religions or cultural uh, beliefs. Uh, to clearly condemn uh, the laws implemented uh, by the Chinese government in relation uh, to Hong Kong and the continual aggression uh, and unhelpful comments that we see from Chinese leadership in relation uh, to Taiwan. These failures and collective actions of, si uh, of silence, failures to speak, have consequences and the consequence is that those who are violating human rights uh, feel that they are continually able to get away uh, with these violations of the law. Now I want to thank particularly the Australian Tibetan Council uh, for inviting me to speak today um, and to you all for coming together on the lawns of the Parliament to make sure uh, that your voices are heard. I want to acknowledge, thank you. I want to acknowledge that our purpose in gathering here today is to call on the Australian government uh, to raise the human rights abuses uh, of the state of China with the foreign minister of China on his visit today. Uh, we must demand of our government that human rights are at the forefront um, of all conversations uh, with the Chinese government and with any government that wishes to have a relationship with the nation of Australia. 
Um, and we must do this in a way that gives the community the greatest possible chance of upholding human rights, uh, both here in Australia and overseas, particularly the right uh, of the freedom of speech, the right to protest, the right to self-determination, the right to live in peace. These are fundamental goals uh, for us here in Australia, and they are being denied to so many globally. As the Tibetan Council invited me to speak here today, I want to make some specific comments uh, now in relation uh, to Tibet. The Australian uh, Greens, and I want to acknowledge my colleague Janet Rice, who over her career has been a relentless, a relentless voice uh, for the peoples of Tibet and a force uh, for, of pressure upon the Australian government uh, in relation to Tibet. Um, and I want to join with you uh, in calling on the Australian government to do all it can uh, to call on China to immediately grant meaningful access to Tibet for independent observers, to ensure that any future Dalai Lama is determined solely by the Tibetan people in accordance uh, with cultural practice and international human rights law, and an end to the oppressive politics of targeting children and workers in Tibet and exploiting particularly workers and their labor. I know many of you here today are from activist groups that have fought oppression for decades. Democracy activists in China, Tibetan rights activists, Uyghur activists, Hong Kong activists, Taiwan activists, and activists across many other human rights uh, issues. An area that I have been doing a lot of work on because it connects so many of the strands of oppression uh, that these communities are experiencing is a bill uh, introduced in the Senate in my name which would end the importation by Australia of goods produced by forced labour. We know that this is an issue particularly affecting uh, the people, uh, the Uyghur peoples and also um, those in Tibet as well. The Australian Labor Party have failed to express their support for this private senator's bill that would have stopped our nation uh, from becoming a dumping ground uh, for these goods. It is unacceptable that Australia is in a position right now where we are open for business to human rights abusers. That must not be the case. We must not accept uh, goods created by forced labour. The Australian Greens are with you uh, in calling for an end uh, to the forced labour and arbitrary detention systems. Uh, peoples must be able to have free expression, freedom and culture and freedom of movement everywhere in the world without exception. Political prisoners must be released. No longer should human rights defenders, peaceful political activists, and those who are working to uphold human rights abuses be subject to imprisonment, to disappearance, and often to violence. This is unacceptable and must be brought to an end. Thank you for your continuing work, for your courage, for your solidarity. We in the Australian Greens will continue to work with you for, for freedom, self-determination and for democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, um, Senator Rice. And thank you, Senator Pocock, who's also here. Um, and I just want to acknowledge, and I think we need to just stop for a moment and just say, um, the Greens all the way back to Senator Bob Brown, you know, who who calls His Holiness the Dalai Lama a dear friend, have been our strongest uh, voice in the parliament, who have been our strongest ally uh, in Australia, and continue to support us. And I just want to say um, a huge thank you to uh, all of the uh, Green staff and, and, the, and the senators that are here today uh, for coming down and supporting us. It means a lot. Thank you. And I would like to introduce Senator Barbara Pocock to you. Um, Senator Pocock is going to take over as the, the Greens co-chair of the Parliament. Thank you so much. We have uh, one more parliamentarian who is um, going to come and speak to us very soon. 
Um, so we'll just uh, hang here. We are going to march to the embassy and the embassy and um, everyone in there uh, who, who we're hearing a rumor that there may be a high level meeting between Australian business leaders and uh, Wang Yi happening down at the embassy or next to the embassy at the Hyatt. So it's really important that you keep your energy up um, and just uh, hold with us for a moment as we uh, anticipate our next speaker. A signal that the Australian people will not be sold for 30 pieces of silver. I, I'm a Christian and every year uh, at Easter we are reminded that we should not sell our souls for 30 pieces of silver. But that is exactly what this federal government is doing. They are continuing to overlook the human rights abuses that are taking place as a result of the Chinese Communist Party with the Uyghurs, with the Tibetans, uh, with what is happening in Hong Kong. And I think we need to uh, continue to hold this government to account. Now, uh, what we have seen just two nights ago in the Senate was uh, Senator Don Farrell talk about how the United States, in his view, was not the most important ally of Australia. Now. Do you think that that might have anything, any correlation to do with this visit here today? Do you think? Yes, yes absolutely. The, what is happening with the Chinese Communist Party uh, around the world, but particularly in, in, in relation to Australia, we are seeing unprecedented amounts of foreign intelligence and foreign interference with the democratic processes in Australia. And uh, I understand that you're seeing this through, through your lens from a human rights perspective and good for you for standing up. But we also, you are Australians as well, hopefully, and uh, you need to understand that what the Chinese Communist Party are doing in Australia uh, will not be accepted. We are seeing unprecedented amounts of foreign interference by the Chinese Communist Party in the democratic processes in Australia. And we cannot allow that to happen unchecked. You know, um, this federal government is so, uh, so motivated to try and, uh, and, and restore, in inverted commas, the relationship with China that it is prepared to overlook the human rights abuses that the Chinese Communist Party are overseeing around the world. And we have to stand together as a country, as a democratic country, and say that we will not allow that to happen. We will not allow it to happen without a, a huge fight in this country. We will not let this government uh, sell out our souls as Australians to China, to the Chinese Communist Party for 30 pieces of silver. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great day today and be loud because we can't hear you right over uh, within Parliament House, so make lots of noise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew Wallace. And I think it's important that we do say as Australians, enliven and respect. Tibetan cultures and customs. This afternoon I was joined with other parliamentarians in an afternoon tea with the Chinese Foreign Minister. I doubt that I'll get an opportunity to raise these issues, but I'm very, very sure that my presence, along with other Australian parliamentarians, will be recorded, will be seen, and it's a demonstration that we live our democratic values in this country and that we aspire in the world to see those democratics pursued and lived out in other places as well. There's one particular challenge that is most important at the moment, and that is we must vigorously rebut, we must vigorously rebut this idea that Tibet has been part of China since antiquity. It is not true. 
the historical record shows that it's not true. International treaty making in the late 1800s, 1900s shows that it's not true. So this morning you'll be hearing from other parliamentarians. As you heard on Sunday, I returned from Dharamashala. It was a wonderful opportunity to meet His Holiness, to talk about Tibet issues, but it was more important, more powerful, to be to reciprocate in that wonderful generosity of Tibetan people who are in North India. But part of that trip, as, as gracious as the opportunity was to meet with His Holiness and how important that was, we had another meeting which was just as impactful. Senator O'Neill, myself, Mr. David Smith, Mr. Michael McCormack met with 15 young Tibetans who had traveled for 10 days through Tibet, across the border into Nepal and had made their way safely to the Dharamashala. And we heard about young women being imprisoned, not for one day, but for three or four years for speaking out in support of Tibetan issues. We heard the story of a young man who was forced to leave his wife and children to flee Chinese oppression. The Chinese had put surveillance devices around his wrists. These things are difficult for Australians to understand and comprehend. And that's why it's so important that parliamentarians like myself and others visit like we do to places like Dharamashala in Northern India so that we can hear first. So in coming out today, it is not the vain. Your voice is very, very loud. You are being heard in the National Parliament. And in the 10 years that I've been a Senator, I'm very, very pleased to say that Tibetan issues have never been more front of mind to the Australian Parliament than they are in 2024. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Your words give us hope. Empty to speak here today and everyone's great efforts in assembling so many people. I would just like to um, ask if the crowd could open up a little bit, make a slightly bigger circle, if you could expand and move back a bit here. Just expand and and I'd like to invite some of the um, Falun Gulfa practitioners who can speak. But um, we also need, it's good that we join together. Just, just anywhere there, that's good, so you can hear. All of the groups represented here today are victims of are victims of the Chinese Communist Party and we're all, I believe, we're members of the Alliance of the Victims of the Chinese Communist Party and the previous speaker, Professor Feng Chong Yi, does a great job in bringing people together. Now first I'd like to talk about things that impact us all and that is the Chinese Communist Party and its essential nature. It's only recently, perhaps since 2017, that parliamentarians in Australia have began to, <clears throat> to understand what the Chinese Communist Party really is. And this is of vital importance to knowing how to respond to the Communist Party and represent the Australian people, because that's what the parliament is for. That's what the government's job is for. It's not to follow any particular ideology members of the government may have. It's to represent, speak up against China on human rights. Now that's over 75%. So what we're doing here today is actually representing most of the Australian people. We should not feel like an isolated small group protesting in front of Parliament House. We are leading the, politi the politicians and MPs and we should continue to do that with kindness and righteousness. And keep doing it in all of your communities. Now, the essential nature of the Communist Party, as many of you have experienced through persecution, is purely evil. There is no other word to describe what the Communist Party is and what it does, what it does to human beings. Now, once you understand that, and many MPs have the benefit of listening to the testimony of persecuted Tibetans, persecuted Uyghurs, persecuted Falun Gong practitioners, they need to hear those personal stories because in Australia, we are not touched by that sort of tragedy. We are not. We are a lucky country. But being part of a lucky country is we have values. We have things that make us... Bastion, next to an oppressive regime in China. China at that time, CC, the CCP at that time, made all sorts of promises. 
It'd be one country, two systems. Hong Kong would remain peaceful, would remain free. But sadly, we've seen that is not the case. We've seen lots of brave students, lots of brave adults, lots of brave people in Hong Kong rise up and be brutally crushed. Now we've got two brave students, two brave speakers here. Eddie and Max, come on over. Tell us about yourselves and tell us about what's going on in Hong Kong. Uh, thanks to the host for inviting us. Um, no, I'm, my name is Edward. I'm from the Hong Kongers Protection Against uh, Chinese, Chinese Expansionism. Uh, ever since the protests in 2019, the Hong Kong government has introduced uh, serious measures to limit um, our, our civil rights and also our ability to host uh, another social movement that can essentially bring about the ability to change uh, to the society of Hong Kong. And uh, I see around the crowd today, and I believe uh, many of us who are gathered around here united by a shared commitment to freedom, justice, and a desire for national self-determination. Uh, we've all had our fair shares of experience with the CCP regime, uh, and like many of you present here, you know, I also feel a growing sense of anger inside me. Uh, as many of the previous speakers had mentioned, what is happening this morning in Australia is not a simple diplomatic. Test, test. Can everyone hear me at the back? Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Nanagawa people, who are part of the oldest surviving continuous cultures on Earth. I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Hello, my name is Tenzin Chokrab Gudaling, and I'm a 14-year-old Tibetan boy here to make a speech. Australia is a land of opportunities, happiness, and grace. It has helped hundreds of thousands of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. It has learned from its ancestors' mistakes, and has given the indigenous custodians of this land, the Aboriginal people, their rights and freedom back. Most people would think Australia's government must be very nice and generous. But it also makes people wonder, what has Australia done wrong? That, in my opinion, is the seventh Australian-China foreign and strategic dialogue. The previous one was delayed or postponed due to tense relationships between two parties. Then they forced us to sign a 17th point agreement in 1949. Ten years later, completely disregarding the agreement and took over Tibet anyways. The Australian government needs to understand that cooperation with the Chinese communists is pointless and will eventually end with our loss. And even if the Tibetan government, sorry, the Australian government converses with the Chinese, they should also talk about the human rights of the oppressed people. Chinese have been circled by Chinese security forces. Since the year 2013, the United Kingdom has been circled by Chinese security forces. Since the year 2013, the United Kingdom has been circled by Chinese security forces. These footage is also a rare glimpse into the real plight and sufferings of the Tibetan people. Therefore, we urge the Chinese government to immediately cease the construction of dams and the concerns of the locals.历史上的西藏是一个独立且自由的国家
to invite to the chief center. A big round of applause, please. Thank you so This is going to test my uh, study skills. So during from 87 to about 89 he was involved in multiple peaceful protests and activities around the cause of freedom in Tibet. He's been to prison two times for those activities. And he says, not for a long time, just eight months, which to me sounds like a long time for voicing your, your, your rights about freedom. But to him he says, it's not a long time, which goes to show just how brave many of these people are. After his release, he was required to stay at home. He was no longer allowed to take part in any form of type of organizations. And uh, he was not able to educate himself uh, in line with the monasteries. Until in 1990, he fled he, he walked over uh, the Himalayas into, into exile in India. In 2018, he moved to Australia for the Salaman program. Uh,
He mentions two younger siblings, my younger sister and a younger brother, both of whom had, we had been to prison two to three years at a time. But he raises a broader question, why are we actually here? What are we here to do? Of course we're here to advocate, advocate for freedom, for justice, for truth, to speak for those who back in China can no longer speak for themselves. He talks about people that have been the, the fellow, fellow ex-political prisoners, torture victims, survivors, that have been in prison for months, years, some up to 20 years. And he says, we're here to finish what we started. We're here to finish what we started and come face to face. The reason they are so angry the Chinese Communist Party's regime being persecuted, and here they are also calling all those anti-Asian and politicians, especially those who is now still negotiating with the Chinese Prime Minister Wang Yi for a deal 